There's a certain sort of cocksure thing about asking students to call you, oh, captain, my captain, you know, particularly when it referred originally to Abraham Lincoln. But at the same time, I think there was some certainty on the part of that teacher about what he needed to do with these students, that he needed to free them from the, 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 the bonds of this, of the history of the school and the mission of the school. Welcome to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, a brilliant screenwriter revisits their initial screenplay for what became a beloved movie, discussing what changed, what didn't, and why. From first draft to the big screen. Today's guest is none other than Tom Shulman, the Oscar-winning screenwriter behind the timeless school drama Dead Poets Society. Released in 1989, Tom's affecting story of seven classmates who take a stand against the uniformity of their elite boarding school is a valentine to never letting the world smolder that flame in you that makes life worth living. Best remembered for an astonishing turn by Robin Williams as the kids' teacher John Keating, the movie walked away with Best Original Screenplay at the Academy Awards and Best Film at the BAFTAs. Three decades on, it remains an ingrained part of our pop culture landscape, from the boys' emotive calls of Oh Captain, My Captain, to Keating's advice to Carpe Diem Seize the Day. Writing the film involved deep soul-searching from Tom, whose life story overlaps with the characters in his screenplay. He went to an elite boarding school just like the characters in the film and pulled from his own experiences of feeling suffocated by the forced conformity of it all. Speaking from his home in Los Angeles, Tom told me all about his first draft of the movie, in which Keating is dying of cancer. We also get into how the film would have been a musical titled Sultans of Swing if Disney had had their way, and the scenes that Robin Williams brought his own improvisational magic to after at first struggling to get to grips with the role. No need to stand on your desk at home to listen along, a sofa will do just fine. There is one quick thing to mention before we dive into the episode. Recently we launched a Script Apart spin-off show. How I Write, presented by our friends at Arc Studio Pro, is a series of 22-minute specials in which writers, you guessed it, discuss how they get words on the page, taking listeners on an intimate guide into their creative routines. The first five episodes are available now, featuring Misha Green, Jim Cummings, Breaking Bad's Jennifer Hutchison, and many more. If you'd like to check it out, simply click the link in today's show notes. Thanks as ever to our Patreon supporters, that includes Elena Scott and Tobias Hansen, You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Hey, Tom, welcome to Script Apart. How are you today? I'm good. How about you? I'm all good. I mean, it's it's quite hard to carpe diem seize the day in quarantine, but um, I'm trying. Yeah, no, same here. (laughs) (laughs) So, Dead Poets Society... It has this timeless message for its characters and for its audience to go out and seize the day, to suck the marrow out of life. Um, it's, it's such an enduring message that people are still discovering and embracing today. Did you set out to write a movie with that lesson at its heart? Or was it a moral that you found as you kind of burrowed your way into the story? I think the latter. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm almost pretty sure the latter. It's been a long time so uh, <laughs> since I wrote it. but. Um, I think it's one of those things where, you know, I think someone once famously said, I I write so that I can know what I think. And I think that's probably what happened with that as I slowly developed the story, the the theme, what what I was writing about, what I was trying to say started to emerge. And what kind of moment were you at in your life that made that message about taking life by the horns and seizing the day? seem like such a vital and important thing to impart into a screenplay. Is there anything that was going on in your own life at that time that you can pinpoint now, years on, as the thing that kind of drew you towards Carpe Diem, telling this kind of story? That's a really interesting question. Um, You know, I I think I started to um, think about writing the story maybe five years before I wrote it, Um, maybe four. Um, And I don't really know what. You know, I mean, it seemed to me I was just, you know, struggling screenwriter, uh, doing sort of, you know, boring production jobs here in Los Angeles and sort of scraping by and, you know, had, had lots of hope and, and optimism, but but fairly un- both unfounded. <laughs> no, no real reason for that. Um, so um, 
Um, I, I don't know. I don't think looking back on it that I felt that I wasn't seizing the day, but, but I probably wouldn't have thought that I was either. So I don't know. <laughs> but what would you say is the split between autobiography and fiction in this movie? Because you went to an all boys high school. You had an iconoclastic teacher among other experiences that are echoed in the screenplay, right? So what were some of the experiences from your own life that you were feeding into the, into the story? Uh, every character in the, in the movie was someone that I knew, although at a different time in my life. So for instance, Neil was based on a friend I had had much younger uh, when, I, when I was in my you know, early teens. Charlie and uh, was based on someone, uh, a friend I knew in college. Charlie was someone I knew in high school. Knox was someone I knew in college. So, you know, once I sort of understood the, the function of each character in the story, then I sort of cast around for the person in my life who would best fit that role and then use them as the sort of guide for the character. All of it, it's autobiographical in that mm -hmm. sense. But since the story's made up, it's hard to say, you know, I mean, you try to bring as much of yourself and your experience to, to everything you write. So, um, you know, as you said, Keating was based on a, a, a teacher, a, really a couple teachers that I had, basically one. And um, the school was not the school I went to. It was a, a deeper, darker version of the school I went to. But it, I, I suppose it's the school that the headmaster of, of my actual school wished our school, he, our school could, be. <laughs> but but uh, the school was a little too progressive for that by the time I got there. So, um, uh, although a very conservative place, so hard to say. I'm always curious when screenwriters tell me about pulling inspiration from real life people within their lives. What the reaction of those people were when they saw the film, if they recognized themselves on the screen, and yeah, what their responses were. The big one is Keating. There was a real life teacher, as you say, who, from what I've read, was a pretty inspirational figure at the school you were at, but left abruptly, leaving all these rumours kind of swirling about an affair with the headmaster's wife and all this sort of thing. That's right. That's did, right. Did you ever track that person down or vice versa? Did they ever find you to tell you, you know, congratulations on the Oscar success? Or um, Yeah. Uh, I mean, first of all, it, it, looking back on it, it's interesting because I think, as you say, all those rumours were swirling around and um, I think, and we didn't know as, as students, we didn't know, and we were too afraid to ask because we felt like it might be so uncomfortable for the, the, the powers that be to give us an answer. So the fact that I never knew left it a mystery and something that I could write about. I think if I had found out what really happened, which was that he simply left because he got a, a better job offer, then <laughs> <laughs> I may have never written the story. Um, and when the, uh, I think maybe a month or two before the movie was due to come out, I finally tracked um, um, Sam Pickering, who was my sophomore English teacher, uh, down. And he, he was a professor at University of Connecticut in Stores, Connecticut, and uh, wrote him a, a letter saying, you know, this, this is, you're in, you inspired this and it's coming out soon. And he wrote me back a very nice note saying, you know, very excited to see it. Didn't hear from him, I think, right after the movie came out, but maybe six months later, I was on a panel at my university with him. And uh, he began his talk by saying that he sort of recognized himself in the movie and he sort of didn't, you know, and that, that certainly the philosophy of Carpe Diem, had he lived that himself, he probably wouldn't still be there to be on the panel, you know, <laughs> that he would have <laughs> <laughs> sown his wild oats into oblivion. So, um, but but he was uh, you know a really good guy always you know and and I think very upbeat about it and congratulated me at that time on the movie and uh, I think moved on you know um, I certainly felt like the movie to a certain extent represented you know what particularly his affect the sort of loving way that he approached teaching and the students you know I thought was 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 who he was. And how about for any of the other characters? Um, I don't think anybody else recognized themselves. They didn't. No, no one called me and said, oh my God, that was me, right? <laughs> yeah, probably for the best in some cases. So 
I think I read once that you have a certain process when it comes to story ideas and stress testing them to see if there's enough material in them to sustain a great movie. So you've got to correct me if I'm wrong. You create a word doc, you then add details and ideas for the world and characters you're creating into that doc as they come to you. And then once you've hit like a hundred pages or whatever arbitrary page number, that's when you know there's something here. Was that the case with Dead Poets Society? Yes. And I think it was one of the first ones. I, I can't remember back, uh, I think it was fifth, sixth screenplay, something like that. And I had been doing that since maybe two screenplays before that. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. I think I had something like 175 pages of notes in my computer file for that story. And then, you know, what I did was I went through and sort of cleaned them up and made each idea a sort of separate paragraph on the page and then sliced the, every page up, you know, so that each idea was on its own piece of paper, made a stack of those and then picked them off the stack and said, okay, this feels like something that's in the beginning third of the movie. This is in the middle of the movie. This is at the end, laid them out that way and then picked up the, the stack that was now the first third of the movie and started placing them on the floor all around the room in, in what I hoped would be a rough order. And then as I did that, I would say, gosh, I don't know how I get from this scene, you know, scene four to scene five. They don't even connect. But and I would try to think of something. But while I couldn't while I was deliberating that, I was also moving other things around. So my unconscious was working. And it turned out to be a really good method because I'd be putting, you know, scenes 50 and 60 down on the floor. And suddenly I'd go, oh, I know what to do for four and five. I'd make a note about that, type it into the computer, print it out, put that over there between four and five, and gradually laid the whole screenplay out that way. That sounds like a process that makes you a great screenwriter, but probably a bad roommate. It was not, you know, I had to clear the floor, you know, my, every, no one was allowed to come in that room. It was, uh, it was, you know, I had to tiptoe around because the planning for how, how much space each scene would take, you know, it was no way to plan. You didn't know. So yeah. suddenly you're going, Oh my God, there's all this extra material here for scene seven, but there's no room for it on the floor. So you end up stacking up scene seven. Eventually you end up with 50 or 60 stacks, which are the 50 or 60 scenes of the movie. Then you pick them up and put them in a notebook, you know, paste them to paper and to eight by 10 pages, punch the holes, and you have a notebook or two that's basically a very detailed outline for the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, it's laborious. And, you know, I've tried to skip that process on some screenplays. <laughs> and and uh, I think it's always better to do it as much yeah. as I dread it every time I start. It's, it's, a, it's the best way to go for me. And once you had all that assembled, did the screenplay pour out of you? I'm interested to know, yeah, what the actual writing process was like kind of emotionally, because I can imagine it must have been pretty cathartic, even if these weren't your exact life experiences. Because the screen, they, there were so many notes and the scenes laid themselves out that way. And because I sort of fanatically tried to make sure I could connect all the dots as I was putting all those pieces of paper down on the floor, I wrote all the scenes in and out of order as I did it that way. So if I was suddenly on scene 30 and I realized, oh, I know what this scene the teacher's gonna be teaching about, I would write that scene right then and there. Pretty rough, pretty straight off top of the head, put that on the floor there. So by the time I got done, that outline, except for all the things that had to be removed, was the screenplay. So when I would say, okay, now it's time for the, the, um, the speech that's gonna take place in the honor room, I had it right there. I knew exactly what he was going to say. All I had to do was sort of reorder it to make sure it worked, smooth it out, you know. So oddly, when I was actually putting the script together in that cut and paste way, it was fairly boring, you know. And I would find myself in the middle of speeches that were supposed to be these inspiring things, you know, live your life, carpe diem. I'd be falling asleep as I was writing them. It was really strange. And some part of me thought, my God, this, this, maybe this thing is a mess. It doesn't work at all. But when I finally went back and had it all ready and, you know, to start the process of rewriting and refining and polishing it, then I could start to feel like, oh, I could start to put more power into the, you know, more myself into the, to the, what was going to be the final or felt like would be the final version of the first draft. 
So when did the, if, if there wasn't much of an emotional release when you were writing, did an emotional release come later on when you, when you saw the film for the first time and saw elements of your own life kind of there on screen? Did you have that cathartic reaction then, or were you able just to stay fairly well detached from the project at all times? It was, it, by the way, I did I did have an emotional response to the writing. You know, when it was as it started to, as I polished it and got it in shape, I would have you know a very strong emotional attack to to every, particularly the ending. You know, and I would once the ending on the page, you know, really brought up a lot of emotion in me. And I felt like, oh, my God, this is really working. So I, you know, the film had the same feeling really for me, you know, and I, I, after the first time I saw it, I was sort of no longer overwhelmed with it. And then I could see it more objectively. Oh, I think we need to trim this. And, you know, the same process that would happen when you're writing, you know, because editing a movie and rewriting a movie are pretty much the same process. So um, not that Peter Weir, did all my notes, you know, by no means <laughs> yeah. did he, but, 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 uh, but if nothing else, I could have a, you know, somewhat detached, uh, view of it. I suppose one of the emotions when you did see it for the first time, contributing to that feeling of being overwhelmed must have just, must have just been relief because, you know, um, you, from what I've read, I mean, we could be very well sat here discussing a very different movie. We could be here talking about a musical called Sultans of Strut, which uh, was was Disney's note, right? Can you, can you tell me briefly about that terrifying near miss and uh, some of the other suggested changes to the script that you resisted as you started to shop the script around? Right. Um, yeah, Sultans of Strut, I think, um, I mean, first of all, when I f- finished the screenplay and showed it to my agent, he called me at two in the morning sort of sniffling, which was kind of, you know, the phone rings at two in the morning. Nowadays, it's your cell phone. You don't even pick it up. But yeah. but back then it was a landline. So I, oh my God, somebody's, you know, dead. So I pick up the phone and it's my agent saying, I just finished your screenplay and I'm sorry to wake you up, but it's the best thing I've ever read. And let's talk in the morning. And I said, wow. So in the morning I called him and he said, you know, it is the best thing I've ever read, but I don't think I can sell it. He said, you know, boy, boys boarding school, no sex, no violence, you know, poetry. It's a really hard sell. You know, I think it's a great calling card, but I, I wouldn't even pretend to try to sell it. And if you want to try to sell it, you're going to have to get a new agent. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, with that, I set out to find a new agent. And I would say, you know, four out of five agents passed. The one agent who took it on said, you know, I've only read half of it, but I think there are a lot of clients here at my agency, actors who would be interested. So I think I could put this together. So, you know, I, I went ahead and uh, signed with him and, you know, sort of lived in fear that he would read the other half of the screenplay and then fire me as a client. But he, I don't know that he ever did. But uh, but after months, he couldn't get it going. And finally, he did get me a meeting at Disney where I went in and they were you know, they much liked the screenplay, they said, but they felt similar to my first agent that, you know, it's, first of all, the title, you know, the three worst words you can imagine all in one title, you know, <laughs> so uh, dead poets aside. And um, they also felt like, you know, in, as a poetry, the audience is not going to connect with that. So how about dance? And we have this idea that we even have a title. He'd be a dance teacher, Sultans of Strut could be the te- the name, you know, think about it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, thank you very much. And I went home and thought about it and thought, no, no, thank you. So, um, uh, uh, and then um, sort of out of nowhere, Stephen Haft, a producer who had read it, I think in the early going when I'd first signed with that agent and hadn't responded. And then maybe a year and a half later called my agent and said, I can't get this story out of my mind. Um, I'm, I, I like to take a shot at it. So he optioned it and he took it to Jeffrey Katzenberg at Disney. Although Disney had passed, Jeffrey had never seen it and didn't know Disney had passed. So he read it and he bought it the same, same day, actually late that night. Um, and then a couple of days later, uh, went in with the, that director, the first director and, um, uh, there was a group of, of executives sitting on a couch and Jeffrey Katzenberg was sitting over at his desk reading something. And so I was, we were making small talk with the executives 
And finally, Jeffrey turned around in his chair and said, uh, who, who wrote the notes, guys? And these, this it was a sheaf of notes that I had received the night before. It was about 50 pages long that started something like, although we really appreciate the screenplay and admire a lot of the writing, the story is screwed up and, you know, it's an ensemble piece. We don't want to make an ensemble piece. It should be more, Keating should be the main character. Let's start with him when he's in high school and see his, you know, the, the formative years of his life and move on from there. And the teaching part would only be the last third of the movie. And I, I mean, when I got that, I was sweating bullets. I mean, I sold it to them. <laughs> and now I thought, oh, my God, they're going to destroy this thing. So I was really nervous in the meeting. So when Katz, Katzenberg turned around and said to the group who wrote the notes and they said, well, it was a group effort on our part. You know, they're not polished yet. We we need to you know put more work in it. And he said, you know, you're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, don't you think, guys? And he took the notes and threw them over his shoulder onto the floor and said, let's just make the movie. And I mean, I don't think that ever happens, but it, it happened. So he came over and we just started discussing casting and so forth and uh, never had to do those notes. But, you know, another executive at another studio might have, you know, not even looked at the notes, just told the development team, go at it and, and you know, we'll see you in a year and see what see what you make of it. So, you know, it survived that. I'm, I'm so glad you bring up the fact that this is an ensemble movie. And I love the fact it's an ensemble movie because if it was a tale told through just one uh, protagonist, you would only see kind of, I guess you'd only see one vision of the way that um, Carpe Diem can be applied to people's lives. But in the way that you tell the story through the perspective of multiple boys, we do see this multitude of ways that you can seize the day and multitude of ways that... Uh, Keating's uh, words in class inspire these kids. Was that was that the intention? Was that why it was so important to you to keep the essence of this film an ensemble thing rather than reducing it to here's here's the hero who we're going to tell the story through? Absolutely. You know, it was really more about the for me by the by the time I f sort of figured out what I was writing about that that it, the message in some sense was more important or the theme was more important than any of the characters. So it was, it was critical, as you say, that, you know, we see how this particular message can play out in different ways. I got to pick up something you said a moment ago there, Tom, you mentioned that time and time again, the thing that people picked up on was dead poet society. They didn't like the name and you kept getting that note over and over and over again. Pete Weir, from what I understand, he only read the script because he was intrigued by the name. He was on a plane one day and in his words, he couldn't resist. It's incredible watching the film. You guys obviously were just on the same page. I'd be interested to know what some of the conversations were that you shared. There were so many little flourishes in his direction that complement your script and bring your script to life visually in an amazing way. And uh, yeah, there's just this sense that he really understood the material. How did you guys kind of, kind of hit it off? Uh, I thought we hit it off really well. I mean, and, and you know, he had gone to a, an all boys boarding school himself. You know, he knew that culture well. I think Robin had gone to a day school in, in Detroit that similar kind of culture, you know, but um, uh, so and Peter, you know, really got it from from the get go. Uh, we had one disagreement about one scene in the movie and, you know, ultimately he won that that argument. But even there, he was. He was amazing about it because he said to me, you know, I'm not going to force you to cut this scene. He said, I don't know that I can direct the movie if the scene has to be in there because I think you're making a big <laughs> mistake to have it. He said, but, you know, my goal is to convince you that it's better with it out than in. If uh, so, you know, this this will be that kind of conversation, not one of, hey, cut it or, or you're fired or one of those things, you know, so. Uh, and, you know, he said from the beginning, uh, he, he asked me when we first met, why aren't you, you know, this is such a personal story and you seem to understand the way it's going to look and feel. Why aren't you directing it? I said, you know, you have no idea how hard this was to get it made. <laughs> and, you know, you're in my mind, when I, the night I finished the first draft of the screenplay, my wife and I went to see Witness in the theaters for the first time. And when we got done, I just said, to her, this is the guy that's got to direct and poet society, you know, and little what I know that it would take five years before that would happen, <laughs> but, uh, uh, or four years, but, uh, uh, you know, so he was my first choice from way back then. And, uh, uh, 
So for me, it was, it was perfect. And, and, you know, he wanted me on the set and uh, he was generous about that. We talked about, you know, every shot, every scene, and he was, he was amazing that way. So we, our vision of the movie was, was identical, I would say. I think I know, or I think I might know what that scene is that you disagreed in, but we'll come to it. But first, let's just dive in a little bit to to this draft that you sent over, which was fascinating to read as someone who's loved this film for a long time. Both my parents are teachers. You don't see many teacher films. It's uh, they're kind of unsung heroes, cinematically speaking. You begin this film in Welton Academy Dining Hall, daytime. On the left is a life-sized mural depicting a group of young schoolboys looking up adoringly at a woman who represents liberty. On the right is a mural showing young men gathered around an industrialist in a corporate boardroom. Between the murals stands a boy. So you then go on to describe a full-size portrait of a 19th century Scotsman in a kilt. In front of this, young boys carrying banners and several elderly men in old-fashioned costumes who are assembling into a processional formation. This opening page feels really deliberate in its depiction of long slate and stone hallways through which the haunting timbre of bagpipes reverberates. And amongst all this, you have these nervous young boys carrying candles, each one of them, as you put it, dressed in an archaic turn of the century outfit. It feels like you're trying to begin the story here by showing the uniformity from which the boys will spend the film trying to break out. What was the intention when it came to this opening scene and why start here? I mean, the, you know, the school, the, the four, I, I can't even remember uh, uh, the banners that they carried and the, you know, what each, I, I can't remember what they were. Um, tradition, honor. tradition, honor, um, so Excellence forth. Excellence uh, might have been in yeah, the mix. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but to me, the sort of rigid, um, uh, the rigidity of the institution was important. And uh, although the institution stood for many good things, the the uh, sort of weight that they put into it and the sort of sense of that shoe on your your head sort of grinding these these concepts into you um, was something that I wanted to capture r- right away because I think that's the essential background of the movie. And you know, I said it in 1959, and even though you know the 50s and 60s are really not, uh, the you know, the sort of neatly uh, defined era of conformity and era of, of, of you know, uh, non-conformity that they have, have, you know, over the years sort of been um, reconceived to be. It was important to see this as part of that early era where, you know, conformity was, was something to be, uh, was a social value to be appreciated. Mm. And, you know, fitting, fitting in and being sort of part of society was, was what, you know, at least the early fifties, late forties, early fifties in America seemed to be about, you know, so, and it, to me, it was suffocating. So I wanted to suffocate the audience with that, with that at the beginning and, um, and suffocate the boys with that, you know, and you have your new tu- student Todd, who's there already has problems communicating, you know, is very insecure. So a school like this would be sort of doubly uh, repressive for him. So that was the whole intent of the beginning. Mm-hmm. We and, even though it's, and even though it's an ensemble, Todd is really in some big structural sense, the main character of the movie. We also meet on this opening page, Gail Nolan, who's the headmaster. And you describe him as a big man in his mid fifties. He addresses the school kids. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished alumni and students, this year marks the 100th year that Welton Academy has been in existence. Applause begins, soon the whole room is standing in thunderous ovation. 100 years ago in 1859, 41 boys sat in this room and were asked the same question that now greets you at the start of each semester. Gentlemen, what are the four pillars? And things like this come up uh, quite a lot through the screenplay, Tom, like these these references to the history of Welton and how many generations of boys came before these boys. Was there something you were looking to explore with that? Because it, to me, it always felt like uh, it always lent the sense that these boys are just next in line on the Welton factory, uh, factory like manufacturing line for, for young, young men. And Todd in particular, you say he had a, you mentioned that he had a brother who went there and he's kind of Compared to his brother, there are big shoes to fill, I think is the line. Was there something that you wanted to explore by sprinkling in these allusions to the burden of expectation on these kids and 
the history that they're in the shadow of. I think the word you just said, burden, is exactly what what it was meant to to denote. You know that this is the burden of the history, the burden of the responsibility that you have as a as a student at that school. You know, you you're, and I think the school would think of itself as a sort of factory to to produce sort of perfect gentlemen. You know, um, so. Um, but for the students, particularly ones who who might want to think for themselves a little bit, it's it's that that makes it difficult, you know. On page six, we then get to our first mention of Mr. Keating. Gail, what's this? I hear about a new junior English teacher. Asks Mr. Perry. A few moments later, we'll actually meet the man himself. So you introduce him across the lawn. A black robed teacher stands with his back to us, staring at the beautiful Welton Lake, as if he sensed being watched. He turns and faces us. This is John Keating, late 30s, sparkling eyes. So I guess before we go any further, let's talk about Keating. We should address the magic that Robin Williams brought to this role. I know there were a few other people in the frame to play Keating, including Dustin Hoffman, who I think at one point was set to direct the movie as well. Can you tell me about working with Robin and also your initial reaction to Robin getting the part? Because, you know, at that time, Robin was known as this brilliantly funny comedic fireball just erupting with energy. And this character, as he's written, required quite a lot of restraint. Did you, uh, you know, harbor any kind of secret apprehensions? Were there any nerves? Or did you trust that he would pull this off? Um, the, the, the former. I was nervous, you know. I, mean, I, <laughs> I thought Robin was a brilliant comic actor, uh, but I didn't see the, how there could be a synthesis between the kind of comedy that he liked, that he, that he did, and the character, you know, so I, I was very concerned about how how he would pull this off. And, um, you know, and as much as I trusted Peter Weir and knew what a great director he was, had no idea of how he was going <laughs> to conceive of that blend and get Robin to do it. And um, ironically, the first and I shared that with Peter and Peter nodded. And then the first day that Robin was on the set. Uh, and he was, he had been in New York doing a play. So we just had him for a day and he was going to shoot a scene, an outdoor scene that we needed to get before the, the fall leaves uh, disappeared and then come back two weeks later and, you know, be with us for the rest of the shoot. And in that particular scene, which I think was an introduction, uh, introducing the kids to soccer uh, or football, I'm sorry, as you call it, um, <laughs> he, um, Robin was very stiff. He had the he knew the words had had it down pat, but it felt sort of rote and uh, you know frankly not not sort of dead. And Peter had him doing the scene over and over again, and it never got any better. And we finally took a break, and Robin started the a lot of the kids at the school that we were shooting at had been sitting on the. Uh, sidelines of the soccer field watching. So Robin took a, a megaphone and started entertaining them. And Peter just said, you know, we'll just break for the day. And I said, well, that means we're not going to shoot this scene anymore. He said, yeah, that's right. So at, that night I said to Peter, you know, I got to tell you, right. He said, no, I saw it very stiff. I said, what are we going to do? He goes, I don't know. We've got two weeks to figure it out because <laughs> Robin was coming back in two weeks. So two weeks later, Robin came back and we started shooting with an interior classroom scene and Robin, again, fairly stiff. And Peter said, I want to take a break and let's just do a little improv. And he said, Robin, if you were actually teaching these students, what would you want? To, what would you do? Robin goes, I don't know. I guess I'd read to them, maybe teach them a little Shakespeare. Peter said, great. And he told them, the cameraman to roll and Robin came in. And that's when he improvised that scene, which is now in the movie with him doing John Wayne, doing Macbeth, <laughs> you know, and um, uh, and he read to the boys and so forth. And immediately he saw something that had been missing from his performance before, which is teaching is a dialogue. Even if the students never say a word, you're it's like it's almost like stand up comedy performance. You know, you're in the classroom, you're connecting with the boys, you're you're right there with them and you're looking for, you know, changes in their expressions. And of course, Robin can do that easily because he was a stand-up comedian. So he instantly got it in that, in that uh, improvisation. Some of it made it to the movie, but most importantly, he understood from that point point on exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, it was both him, a blend of him doing that teacher. And it was, the teacher was him and, you know, it was perfect. 
from that moment on for me. And, uh, and that's how it, that's how it happened. So, um, but what we, was there another question that we, that was, uh, <laughs> no, that was perfect. So if that was the moment that kind of put your nerves to rest and convince you that Robin could pull it off, what was the moment that you realized, hold on, he's actually bringing something really special here and that he's sparkling and excelling in this performance? Right there. Oh, you know, really? He was, oh yeah. Now from that moment on, he could bring, he could do no wrong. He could do the words as written. He could add to them. He could twist them, embellish them. He had it. So, you know, I was no longer concise. I, I, as a writer, I'm never, you know, there's got to always be a better way to say it, if whether I can think of it or someone else can think of it. So it didn't bother me what he was doing to the words in terms of improvisational additions or whatever. It was just that he got the essence of the character. He was connecting with those kids. He knew that he was there to reach each one of them, you know, and each of them were, you know, at the, from the beginning, they're a mystery to the teacher. So what have I got to do to get to this student? What I've got to do to get to that student, et cetera. All that was going on with him. And, you know, I see, I was completely relaxed about it from that point on. Do you ever allow yourself to think about what it would have been like if any of the other actors like Tom Hanks or Liam Neeson had ended up doing the role? Or is, is Robin's contribution to this film just too enormous to divorce from? It's impossible to, as if it's impossible to imagine anyone else in the role now. Um, I don't, I've, you know, it's, it, it, you know, the movie very quickly replaces all your thoughts, your earlier thoughts as a writer, you know, mm -hmm. so the movie becomes the screenplay and it, there's no way to separate them anymore. Um, we did a, a, a version of it off Broadway as a play uh, with Jason Sudeikis doing um, Keating and he was fabulous and he brought mm -hmm. himself to the role and he, understood it in the same way as, 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 what, as to what to do, but he had a different way of connecting with the students and so forth. And for me, once I started going and watching those performances, it completely replaced the movie. I could no longer <laughs> see the movie in my head. It became that, that play, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and by the way, the play was 90 minutes long. The movie, I think it's two hours and 15 or two twenty, And after the play, I couldn't figure out how, how there needed to be anything else in the movie. It felt like the movie should have been 90 minutes long. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think, I think when it's working well, that's as a writer, that's what you're looking for. You're just, you're looking for someone to just take the role over and make, make that the role that you always thought you were writing. So over the next few pages, we're introduced to Neil, Pitts, Weeks. We also meet Todd, who of course, was kind of the surrogate for you in this movie. And um, as you mentioned, when we meet him, he's struggling to speak. There is so much power and poignancy in the ending. The sight of him yelling and speaking out for Mr. Keating at the end is all the more powerful because that's the opposite place that he began the movie when he was almost unable to talk. Talk me through that kind of like uh, inability to speak and why that became a motif in the film. I mean, I, it was a motif more than anything because that's, it was autobiographical. You know, in high school, I was extremely shy. I mean, you know, sort of uh, pathologically shy in terms of speaking up in class. Um, so, for instance, it was required of each student that, that w twice during your time there, you would deliver a five minute address to the assembly of the entire school. And I, you know, terrifying. You had to write it yourself and deliver it yourself without notes. So, you know, you, most kids would memorize it. And it was, you know, it was a hard experience, even for the most extroverted of kids. And I managed to somehow dodge having to do that the entire time I was there. You know, I would get sick, <laughs> show up, you know, not for the day, for the day or whatever. And, and uh, I broke my leg my senior year in high school and was out from November to the rest of the year. And I remember feeling at least one sense of relief that I would not have to ever give that assembly speech. So, um, and that lack of, I think, you know, part of what for me was, was the allure of being a writer would be that I could, you know, write and send my manuscripts off to somewhere and never have to deal with, you know, being in a room and, you know, having to, having to discuss things and, um, and, and, um, uh, but, 
fairly quickly in Hollywood, I realized that's not going to be the case. You know, there, you're going to have to go pitch things. You're going to have to learn to get over this. So at the same time that I was learning to do that, I was writing this movie. So, um, and I think perhaps somewhere, even though I, I, you know, I chose this theme carpe diem and seize the day and this, this sort of, um, sort of bravely grabbing what you hope is yours in life, you know, and gave it to a person and maybe back to your, one of your first questions, it was something that I had to work through for myself as a human being in order to, and I did that through the writing somehow. Mm -hmm. And of course, gave my character the heroic turn at the end, (laughs) you know, but, but, uh, um, it's some sort of hopeful fantasy that it would all somehow pay off, you know, but, but, um, I think Todd's journey, you know, not so deliberate at first became and not so well thought out, you know, uh, unconsciously worked for the, for the writing, for the story. And I love the first scene where we see Keating get to grips with his students. You've just had before this sort of glimpse of a very dull formal chemistry lesson. And then juxtaposing it, we have, we've dropped into Keating's class and it's here that you introduce the Walt Whitman line, Oh Captain, My Captain, that will return in the most emotive way later in the film. Um, it's, it's a line that really ingrained itself in our pop culture afterwards. Um, and of course, like when, when Robin tragically died in 2014, Oh Captain, My Captain was the hashtag that fans used to pay tribute. I mean, it's, it's come up in The Simpsons. It just seems to, since Dead Poet Society, it's become part of our pop cultural landscape. What function did you want the line to have? How did it end up in the film? And um, yeah, did you have any clue as you weaved it into the movie that it might become something that would live on? Well, I thought it would live on with the boys who were his students. You know, there's a certain sort of cocksure thing about asking students to call you, oh, captain, my captain, you know, particularly when it referred originally to Abraham Lincoln, you know, it's like this conceit, you know, of the teacher, but a, but a wink, you know, it's like... I'm, I'm asking you to do this, but we both know it's, it's sort of a, you know, it's a bit of a put on. So, um, but at the same time, I think there was some certainty on the part of that teacher that he, about what he needed to do with these students, particularly having gone to the school himself, you know, um, that he need to free them from the, 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 the bonds of this oppressive, you know, the burden, as you put it earlier, of, of, of the history of the school and the mission of the school. Yeah, that's interesting. And as you bring it up, the fact that Keating was formerly a student at the school, was that an element that you introduced for narrative reasons? Because of course, the kids only discover the idea of the Dead Poets Society through reading his old annual. So there is like a narrative function to it. Was there like something thematic that you loved about him having left this school and come back as a different person? Yeah, I think that it was, you know, it it informed why he chose to come there. You know, I think having been there and probably having been there at an even more repressive time than than the school was now, the tradition of the school, it probably hadn't changed much in its hundred year history. I think, you know, because he left that school, went to college, came to London, became a a teacher there. And I think saw that even though, you know, in, in, in our mind's eye in the United States, London was that same traditional kind of place, you know, it, it spawned schools like this. Uh, like art, like Welton all around the world, but somehow he had experienced freedom there, you know, and now when given the opportunity to come back, it was his mission to liberate, you know, and, uh, and only a person who had been there or, or particularly a person who had been, been, been there would, would be, you know, sort of, uh, stoked by that mission. Mm. And I, we next get to the trophy, the trophy room scene. And that's where we we really start to see the magic of Keating and um, the, the magic of the movie as well, in a way, like the combination of the beauty of Keating's speech in that scene to the students, we're, we're food for worms, lads. And the way that Peter directed that moment, letting the camera linger on those photos of past students in almost complete silence. I mean, that moment is just spine tingling. Can you remember how you went about writing that moment? And um, yeah, sort of, again, whether you knew as you wrote it that okay, this is, um, this is quite special and I'm onto something here. 
there were these pictures, you know, uh, in the in the, at the, around the school of all the classes that had been there for, you know, I think our school was 70 years old. So uh, I could remember walking through those halls and seeing those pictures and having that same feeling of, you know, these, these are pictures of kids in the, you know, the late 1800s who, except for their clothing, look exactly like us. And it's, you know, when you're young and impressionable, that is, it's, it's spooky. And, you know, you get that sense of, of, you know, how, how, uh, uh, life is not going, you're not as immortal as you feel, you know, you're, you're going to follow in those people's footsteps. You, someone will be looking at pictures of you one day. So, um, I knew that scene had to be in the movie. It was just that it's right there around you in the school. You know, your mortality is, is right there, even though, you know, you're there, you're there with young kids and you're all young and feel immortal, but, you know, looking right out at you from the walls and the people going, no, not so, you know, mm. and, and who are these people? You never heard of, you know, the school had had a list of the accomplishments of these people, but they were anonymous. So that sense that their lives were all, had all followed this, the path that the school had, had directed them on, but had led to sort of what, you know, mm. so that, that, that burning desire to sort of make your life something you know, more interesting, more exciting, more of a lived experience than that was, you know, that that's what brought that up in me. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was an early, I, I can remember thinking about that scene, you know, before I even wrote the story, you know, I knew that was going to be a, a critical turning point in the early part of the movie. And as we move forward, one cool change in this draft from the finished movie, there's in the film, it's a very prescriptive passage from a poetry textbook instructing students in, in very practical terms how to judge a poem's worth that Keating has the kids rip out of their books. In your draft, it's, uh, it's another poem, Little Blue Boy by Eugene Field. Can you tell me, what, yeah, what was, uh, what was up with that, cha that change? Why did uh, you decide to switch out? I think it, I had Keating reading that poem. He had the lights down. He, he, the boys came into the classroom. He said, sit down, shh, be quiet, really quiet. So he tried to create a kind of holy moment for them and, and make the, and then read them the poem in the sort of, in a way to, to really get the, their, the tears flowing if possible, but because the poem is about a boy who dies and, uh, and then suddenly scream treacle, mawkish treacle and, you know, make them rip it out of the book. And Peter Weir said to me, you know, a lot of people, Little Blue Boy is a very famous poem. And a lot of people, in spite of what you or I might think of it, is, 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 is a pot, is not going to necessarily be thought of as that. And the audience might actually start crying. Well, if, if the actor does a good job <laughs> and then they're going to be really insulted when <laughs> you, you jerk, pull the rug out from under them. So yeah. why don't you find something to the same point, but not, you know, something that would actually appear maybe in the preface of a book or so forth. And then a couple of days later, uh, he came to me and said, I think I've found it. And he found a textbook that had a, a, a preface that, that sort of broke down, you know, writing poetry, et cetera, in the same kind of way that, that it was in the movie. He said, you know, just use this as inspiration, write, write your own version. And, turned out to be a much better idea than the, than the little blue boy. Oh, that's interesting. And the, the boys find uh, Keating's old senior annual, as I mentioned, uh, and they're intrigued by the mention of something called the Dead Poet Society. They ask Keating about it, who says, it was a society dedicated to sucking the marrow out of life. A small group of us would meet in, meet in a cave and take turns reading Shelley, Thoreau, Whitman, our own verse, and in the enchantment of the moment, let them work their magic on us. And of course, he follows that up with, believe me, we did not simply read. We let it drip from our tongues like honey. So, yeah. Where did this idea of the Dead Poet Society come from, Tom? And why was that more, why was that more filmic and uh, appealing than just having these kids sit in class and be inspired by Keating's words? I don't really know how, you know, it seemed to me that, that, that the, the mandate of, the, of, of Keating's teaching as a writer and, you know, for the film was going to be, what are you going to do with this? 
you know, okay, I, you know, you come, I mean, interestingly enough, one of the inspirations for writing this was a, a teacher um, that I had named Harold Clerman, who was a um, Broadway director and a, a critic for the magazine, The Nation, and incredibly brilliant man. And he would come to Los Angeles to this uh, directing, acting, acting and directing workshop that I was at about every two months and review the work and then talk about theater. And he would get up on stage and it was as if he had been alive everywhere on earth for the entire history of civilization. And this man was the best read, knew everything, incredibly inspiring. He could talk for two hours and you felt like it was two minutes and you could listen to him for a month straight and never get bored. <laughs> so, but after two or three hours, it, that we would be over and we would all go out to dinner and talk about, oh my God, this, we've got to, you know, and I would think got to write something about this guy. We've got to change the world. We've got to do all the things he's been inspiring us to do. And then you'd wake up in the morning and go, oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> it was overwhelming. <laughs> and I, I remember having that same thought about the, this, this story. These kids are so inspired but they got to do something about it, you know? And so the first step would be to get together and see what comes, you know, do sort of what Keating's suggesting in class. You know, if poetry is so inspiring, poetry can instruct us as to how we might lead better lives. Let's find some poetry and see where it goes. So that just was a natural step to the progression of let's, you know, the cave and all those things, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, I grew up in Tennessee and, I was lived in a suburb that was right next to to woods and farmland, you know, way the out of the city. So, you know, sneaking out at night and going out into the woods with friends and, you know, all the, the spooky sights and sounds and things and finding cave, there were caves there and et cetera, was just part of the, the magic of, of being young, you know? So um, it worked, I think, pretty well with the, the story. I guess if we're talking in terms of a three act structure, um, I don't know whether you particularly approach this story in those terms, Tom, but this might be considered where the first act ends and act two is all about the infectiousness, the contagion of Keating's lust for life, which begins to set in for each of these boys in different ways. We'll see Knox work up the courage to pursue his crush. We'll see Todd overcome his shyness and we'll see Neil, who we haven't really talked about yet, discover theatre deciding to audition for A Midsummer Night's Dream. Can you tell me about Neil and what he represented to you in this story? You know, I had a friend who, I've, who did not commit suicide, but I think made choices based on uh, the pressures of his father to sort of abandon many of the things that he loved when we were adolescents. So he, to me, was, he, he was the model for the character and you know, I just took it one step further with with the character of Neil, you know, to, to actual suicide. Was there meaning in choosing A Midsummer Night's Dream as the play that he was going to be in? Because, of course, you know, the course of true love never did run smooth, as that uh, play famously said. Neil has got this newfound love for life and things, as you alluded to there, are not going to run smoothly for him. Yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly what, what the choice, how that choice was made. You know, I, th I can remember sort of going back and forth between Midsummer Night's Dream and something from Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, but I ended up choosing, you know, the sort of the more obvious <laughs> thematically uh, uh, aligned um, play. And in terms of all the passions that these boys pursue once kind of Keating's teachings have got inside them, were there any, were there any other like alternative options? Did you, did you kind of, uh, explore anything beyond what's what's in the on the page here i don't think i did i think i think that once i sort of arrived at these characters they were it you know and um i don't remember even thinking about alternatives i, I maybe had one or two but i think i mean maybe Pit, pits and meeks were part of that but i think at a certain point the story just got too too you know the script was 140 pages anyway mm -hmm. and that that was already too long, you know, and I cheated in the way I typed it and so forth to make it look like 129, but it, <laughs> it was actually a, 144 pages long. So in, in standard, so not a surprise that the movie turned out to be over two hours, but, uh, and there's a funny story about that because 
um, I had been on the set for a few days and I had to come back to LA for a couple of days. When I got back, the, they had turned around and were shooting nights. So I arrived and I got to this theater where they were doing Midsummer Night's Dream. And I said, somebody said, Peter wants to, to talk to you. And I said, where is he? And they said, he's over sitting in the audience. And I said, no, I don't see him. And they said, oh, he's like in the third row. So I go over to the third row and I look and he's lying on the floor asleep. Cause we're, you know, then when you turn around and start shooting nights, you're just exhausted. So I, I kind of stood there. And as I walked away, I heard him look up and go, Oh, oh Tom, there you are. And I said, Hey, and he goes, um, I said, I, I heard you wanted to see me. He said, uh, yeah, they sent the script to uh, a script typing service, uh, in LA called Barbara's place, which was famous for typing scripts. He said, and it turned out it's, the script's 144 pages long. I said, Oh, really? Hmm, that's interesting knowing this, of course, was the case. And he said, so we have to cut 25 pages out of the script. <laughs> and I said, Peter, we're like over halfway shooting the movie. If we 25 pages out of what's left to shoot would be like cutting 50 pages out of the movie. <laughs> Which 25 pages do you want to cut? And I, I don't know. We've been through the whole thing. I can't find anything. And I said, well, I, I, I can't. He goes, well, never mind. We'll just shoot it all. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> but uh I don't think that I, I knew at the time there was no room for any other sort of character, you know, to follow um, uh, Keating's teachings. There's actually only, to the best of my memory, there's only one scene in this draft that didn't make the film. The scene has Keating um, telling, teaching these kids how to basically just pass your exam, to, to like fake it. Yeah, yeah. Was that one of the, these scenes that got cut for time after it was revealed that you'd cheated the fonts or something like that? <laughs> no, uh, we, we had actually shot that scene before that. But I had, uh, Peter said to me, I don't think we should shoot this scene so, at some point. And I, of course, thought it was one of the funnier scenes in the movie. So I was resisting that. And Robin, I thought Robin would be keen on shooting it. So I remember Peter saying something in front of Robin about we may not get to that scene. And Robin just kind of went, okay. And I said, I really think we should shoot this. Scene. So finally, Peter said, you know what, if, if it's so important to you, let's shoot the scene and can always cut it later. So we shot it. And uh, later, Peter said, you know, I think it crosses the line with him teaching the kids to cheat. I just think that that goes beyond what a teacher should be doing. So I didn't even put it in the cut of the movie. So mm -hmm that you're going to see. So he said, I just want to prepare you for that. And by that time I, I, you know, I, I could feel the resistance, so it never made it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one scene that did make it in and was never going to be cut is the moment where Keating has Todd unleash a barbaric yawp. And this is, this is hands down one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And I think it's actually one of Ethan Hawke's favorite scenes he's ever shot. Um, there's a great quote here with him talking about how it was one of the most significant days of my life, the day he shot that. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Can you tell me about what you were trying to illustrate or explore in that scene? Uh, I mean, I, I felt that the character of Todd needed to have some, you know, and as I think we all do, a, a talent locked in that he just could not find. And that somehow the, the, the terror of being in front of that class and and nothing to do but have this, he has to satisfy the teacher. Teacher's not going to let him off the hook, not going to let him sit down until he says something. And whatever it's going to be, it, it could be the most boring thing ever, or it could be something interesting, but the teacher's not going to let him get away with, with boring. He's just going to, yeah. and so that by experiencing that maybe within him, there's something unique enough to, to latch on to, to begin to give himself some confidence, um, at least in his academics uh, and what he, what he may have in his heart and soul, you know, it's going to be a turning point for that character. So it, 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 uh, it had to happen. And it was, it, it, the idea came to me when I was watching that teacher I mentioned earlier, Harold Clerman yeah. work on a scene where he, there was a, a young kid in, in this acting class who was doing a scene where the character enters carrying his pants, he's in his underwear, asking his mother to iron his pants. And when the kid did the scene on stage, he was wearing his pants. So he did the scene. And when it was over, Clerman said, why, why didn't you enter carrying your pants? He said, well, I'm, you know, I'm on stage in front of you know, 100 people. I didn't want to. He goes, take off your pants. 
and you know, come in and the kid's like, I, I don't, I'm, I don't have the right kind of underwear on. He says, I don't care if you're <laughs> naked, take off those pants right now. You know, so he did. And the difference in the way he performed that scene was extraordinary. You know, he was unmemorable before and suddenly that all that vulnerability that he felt, you know, brought out something in him as an actor that, that we had never seen before. So mm-hmm. that gave me some thought about the barbaric yacht scene and how that might work. Sounds like it might be a lawsuit today, but <laughs> works great on film. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so as the script moves forward, we start to see this conflict emerge between Keating's unorthodox teaching style and the kids' growing individualism and the various powers that be who begin to clamp down on them across the film. So Nolan uh, lashes out at Charlie for an article in the paper signed from the Dead Poets Society demanding that girls be allowed on uh, be allowed on campus. We also see Neil's father discover that Neil is playing Puck in the play and he bans him from doing so. It's at this point that um, Neil goes to see Neil goes to speak with Keating and we get a solitary fleeting glimpse into who this person might be when it, when not in front of a chalkboard. So there's a framed photo on his desk of a woman and a letter that begins my darling Jessica. In this draft in the finished movie, you really don't show much of Keating's personal life, which, which rings true because I guess like, uh, you know, this is a film told through the perspective of students. When I was a kid at school, I had no idea about the personal lives of my teachers. So I, I don't know, it feels authentic. But am I right in thinking um, at various points in the writing process, you did reveal something about Keating's personal life, that he was dying of cancer? That's right. Yeah. And that's that's the scene that Peter Weir told me had to be removed from the film, or he might not <laughs> might not direct it. You know, bingo. Yeah, it was an inter- It was interesting because in my outline for the script, that 175 page outline that I made and used sort of as a as a bible to write it when I finally sat down to make um, that scene wasn't in there. But when I got to page 75 or wherever I put that scene, it started to I started to ask myself the question. Why this carpe diem thing? What? What's? Where's that coming from? Why? Why? And you know, so somewhere I lit on the answer of okay, he's dying of cancer. Although non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I think you can live for quite a while with that disease. Um, and uh, so I thought, well, okay, that's that's what distinguishes him. That's that's where he gets it. So I had this idea. Okay, the kids come to class one day. There's a substitute teacher. Um, they find out Keating's in the hospital. They go to see him. They discover that he's got this disease. He's back in class a couple days later. You know, all seems fine, but they know that he's got this. And Peter Weir said to me, you know, this is, I think this is a big mistake. I think, you know, you've turned the movie into something that's no longer about a teacher, but it's going to be this sort of weepy, he called it, about with cancer and it's, it's going to overwhelm the movie. And so I think you should take it out. And he said, it's the easiest rewrite I've ever suggested any writer make. You go to page 70, you cut out pages 70 to 73, which was the scene in the hospital. And you don't change anything else (laughs) because nothing else changed there. And I said, well, what explains why he's got this carpe diem? He he says, he, he just does. You don't have to explain it, you know? And I mean, nothing will explain it anyway. Some people could live the same exact life he lived and never come up with that. And others you know, you, you don't need a backstory to explain how a character became who he is. He said, you know, two people can grow up in the exact same household and one becomes one way, one becomes the other. Backstory doesn't tell you anything. First time I'd ever heard that, and I now completely agree with it. But uh, even though studios are constantly giving you notes about they want backstory to explain the present story, it, it, logically it doesn't really. But that's another discussion. So he... <laughs> uh, so I resisted for a while, mainly because friends who had read the script told me how devastated and moved they were when they hit that scene, you know, and, and when I told them, I, you know, I'm getting some, some pressure to cut it out, they're like, no, 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 don't cut it out. So for days, this, this discussion went on between uh, Peter and, and I, and finally he said, um, I think I know why this needs to come out. He said, at the end of the movie, the kids stand up on their desks for him. He said, I think it's fairly easy for people to stand up for someone they know is dying, regardless of what he taught them or so forth. He said, but when they, if he's not dying, then we know for sure they're standing up for what he's taught them. 
And that's the important thing about this that's going on in this movie. Mm. And I heard that and I went, you know what? You're right. And that was it. So, and when we did the theater, theatrical version of the play, I had an opportunity to put it back in and just thought, no, it doesn't belong. So it's, it, Peter was right. So I finally did what he told me he wanted me to do, which was <laughs> cut it from, my, from out of my own, through my own free will, you know? So. That is interesting. And yeah, I mean, that sounds like the right call. It is more powerful to have no reason for Keating wanting to seize the day. You, you shouldn't need to be dying to want to live, right? Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think it would have done to the film tonally if you'd had that kind of reveal and that moment of devastation followed up by the moment of devastation that we're, we're, we're going to inevitably end up at? Or did, did those two things not exist in the same script at that point? They did. They did exist in the same script. And you know, I think one of the arguments I made to Peter was you need to sort of prepare the audience for the suicide. The tone shift that's going to happen there will sort of change the sort of comedic tone of the middle. And he said, you don't need that either. So, um, uh, but yeah, I think, I think we, uh, you know, we were aware. Peter even said to me that he had once met Ingmar Bergman, who had told him there's only one, uh, one rule you can't violate in movies that is never have your main character commit suicide. The audience will hate you for it. <laughs> and Peter said to me, told me that. And I said, Oh my God, you're talking about Neil. And he said, yeah. And I said, what are we going to do? He said, we're going to hope Bergman's wrong. <laughs> you know? that was it. So, uh, Wow. Well, the, the play is a huge success. The boys are all in the audience as Neil crushes it as Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream. But afterwards, Neil's dad pulls him out of the theatre in a fury. He confronts Keating, telling him to stay away from my son. This all leads to a remarkable scene where you're intercutting in your script between a meeting of the Dead Poet Society and Neil's suicide. So the boys are leading this tribal sing-song of Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb, which obviously has big sacrificial connotations, as Neil's dad discovers his son's body. I guess, like, first of all, what drew you to the death of Neil? And how nervous were you about killing off such a lovable young character with his life ahead of him? Did you waver on your resolve to do that, to do something that was so heartbreaking? Mm -hmm. Didn't waver, wasn't nervous about it, too naive to be nervous about it. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, I began to become nervous about it when people would mention to me, you know, I mean, what, by the time I'm, a script makes it to, to shooting and to, into production, you've had 500 people read it, right? From all the way, everybody in the production to studio people, actors, agents, you get thousands of pieces of feedback or hundreds anyway. So a lot of the feedback was, you know, oh my God, the suicide, uh, you know. So I did begin to worry, but uh, did not waver on it. There was sort of no, you know, it just seemed to me to be an essential part of the story. So I couldn't, couldn't think about taking it out. And Peter didn't waver on it either. Why was it essential? There are pluses and minuses to what Keating was teaching. And I think that it also, for me, dramatized the uh, seriousness with which parents and the school took the mission that they had had chosen for for both the school and for their kids that parents were not going to be unbending and wavering in their beliefs about the way kids should lead their lives so um the character of neil that the the real life person that i knew had a father as oppressive and overbearing as as the character's father in the movie so that you know, sort of made me feel like that was just naturally where it would go because I feel like the 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 real life Neil's that wasn't necessarily his name, but the real life's character's father was just like that. Mm. Um, so it, it just never occurred to me to to change it or mm. that it wouldn't be part of the story. And it became a test of the teacher, or uh, uh, and a test of the kids. You know, would they would they continue to embrace that despite what happened to Neil or would they abandon it? And where this gets quite interesting is um, Keating is with them in, in this version of the script. But in the movie, as I recall, he never actually attends one of these dead poet society meetings with the kids. 
He has this deeply ironic dialogue where he's yelling alive, alive into the night sky as Neil is discovered laying dead. So yeah, why why was Keating originally in this scene and why did you take him out? Um, I think that it, it was he was originally in it because I think it made sense after sort of what they perceived as the d- disaster with Neil's dad at the theater. Um, in the original Neil's father took him out of the play before the play was even over. And the play basically, yeah. So like ripped him off stage, basically. Yeah, basically backstage. He came backstage during one of the times that that Puck Neil's off stage and says, I, "You defied me. Get your things." And Neil's like, I, "I'm in the play. Let me finish." No, you know, and took him out. And that <laughs> basically the play the play was <laughs> over. So. um so it had been much more dev, and, and, and but even the way we shot it, and it was decided that he was going to Neil would get to finish the play before we we shot the scene. Um, even there, it just seemed, I think, to to the kids and to 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 Keating that they needed to, he needed to support them in in this now, you know, because they didn't know, of course, that Neil was going to kill himself. So, um, uh, so it felt natural that he would show up at the scene with the, at the at the cave. Uh, we shot the scene. The, at the, in the original, there was a mention that there was a frozen waterfall that uh, sort of beautiful white with all these, you know, stalactite type uh, uh, frozen structures hanging as as frozen waterfalls. If you've ever seen one, are prone to have beautiful thing, uh, but but also icy and chilly and so forth. And they would they were going to do doing the march there and the. Unfortunately, the production couldn't figure out a way to make the frozen ice without it being this really um, uh, urine-like yellow. So we got <laughs> out there and it was just, you know, no matter what, we couldn't make the yellow work. So we just, we shot the scene, but it was horrible and it had to be cut. <laughs> yeah, that probably would have taken me out of the moment a little bit. So Keating becomes the scapegoat for Neil's death, which then leads us towards this tremendously moving, almost iconic final scene. After Keating is fired, Nolan is teaching his class, making the students recite the very poem that Keating had them rip out of the textbooks at the beginning of the movie. Keating comes in to collect his stuff and, you know, engulfed by guilt over his part in Keating's dismissal. Todd stands up in tears, apologising profusely, he stands on his desk, a call back to earlier, and shouts, Oh, Captain, my Captain. And one by one, his classmates join him. Did you always have this as your end point for the story? Or when did you arrive at this, as I say, now iconic ending? As I was writing after I had my 175 page outline, I did not have that scene yet. And I did not know how to end the movie. I, I I had an ending, which was going to be some sort of trial at the school for Keating, some sort of, uh, and I, as I was writing it, the trial, I thought to myself, this, this where, where, where does this happen? This doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, at a school like this, they just fire him. They don't have a trial. So, but, you know, sort of hoping that somehow I would either solve the answer to that question or something else would come. I kept as I was writing the rest of the script, going back and twiddling around on that scene. And at one point during the trial, the kids stood up on their seats and started to say, you know, you know the protest, same protest that happens in the classroom. And then suddenly I said to myself, oh my God, of course, there doesn't need to be a trial. This is what happens in the classroom. And that was it. So maybe halfway through writing the script, I knew that was the end. And then I knew, I thought this, this feels really, really strong to me. So that's when that's, I got it. That's interesting. So when you were pursuing the, the trial ending, was the idea for him to be exonerated and that for there to be a semblance of like a happy ending that I think might struggle still to be a happy ending given this, the suicide of Neil? Did you kind of get that far? Or No, I knew it was going to get dismissed. The mm. trial for me was just going to be a place where the kids could at least speak up for him, you know? Uh, and I think part of what was happening when I was writing the trial was why, you know, first of all, why would they be given the opportunity to speak? This administration is not going to, you know, hold what they say and with, you know, it's not going to help. 
the, the teacher and it's wordy and boring and they say the same things and it's, they're, they're too young to be that articulate about it. So what am I doing here? You know, it's not, it's not working, but I did know that, that he was going to be fired in spite of what they said that much. I knew. Yeah. That's what's so wonderful about the ending. There's a small smile that Keaton gives the kids and then fade to black. There's no manufactured happy ending, but emotionally that's a happy ending. He knows that the kids are sorry and the connection that they forged over the course of these last two hours. We're seeing it in the classroom, which is much more fitting than in a trial setting. It all seems to piece together quite nicely. Was there um, any resistance at any point to sort of like not giving a happy ending? No, I mean, I think I think the what makes it work is that he they've given him the 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 uh, satisfaction of knowing that he reached them. You know, that, that what he was trying to say that and that that's enough. That's all he needed as a teacher. So um, and no, I think the studio, I mean, I think at one point they told me that they bought the script because of the ending, you know, whatever that means. But uh, <laughs> so, no, there was no resistance to that. That's good to hear. And Tom, the, the film still resonates today. And of course, after Robin's death in 2014, a whole new audience sought out the movie, giving it this tragic but quite uplifting second life almost. What do you think it is that's proven so timeless about Dead Poet Society? I mean, you're asking a writer and that's always a hard, hard thing to figure <laughs> out, you know, because, you know, you, you write and who knows whether, whether what you write has any resonance anywhere. So I'm just grateful that people, you know, fi find that they can get something out of it. And, um, you know, it's really up to others to, to, to know how or why it, it might, you know, last. How about I approach this from a different way? If uh, What is it that's so timeless about the message of the movie? Like it's still relevant today to seize the day, carpe diem, and in 50 years time, it'll still be relevant then. You know, in my, in, in my school, Montgomery Bell Academy, the school that was not the model, but, you know, it was where I went. The, the, uh, there was a lady named uh, Mary Helen Lowry who was, in charge of the English department. I think she'd been there 30 or 40 years and was sort of the, 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 uh, uh, constant inspiration for the direction of the English department. And she said, you know, your mission as teachers and your mission as students is to understand the human condition. That's what, that's what this is about. That's what all English writing is about. And, um, she was quite a liberal person, by the way. We we went to see she Malcolm X had come to town when I was in 1966 or five, and she made us go downtown and to his speech. You know, she was intent on giving us a broad liberal education, not not the sort of what you would have expected from that the school in the movie. But anyway, so I was always thinking of the human condition and what that is, and I think it's the answer to your question. The human condition is has not changed, at least as we, as far as we can tell, since humans first started writing about it back in the Greek days. And I don't think it's going to change in the next, you know, 50, 100,000 years. Although I think we think with, with, you know, the internet and so forth and digital and computerization, so that maybe it will, you know, uh, my, my older son told me that he's decided there's no reason to read any book that was about human nature that was written before the digital age because it's, they weren't relevant anymore, which, you know, I have a hard time dismissing as a concept, but, but and he may be right. But some part of me thinks that in spite of all these things, w w you know, our condition on this planet will, will, you know, will be what it, what it's been. And, and if the movie resonates for that reason, that's the reason mm. it resonates. It'll be because human nature hasn't changed and, it, and the messages will still be relevant. Did you, what, what kind of examples of the resonance that the film did have, did, did you kind of encounter? Because I mean, you must have had people come over to come up to you over the years, keen to tell you about how you know, that they took the movie's message to heart. They seized the day because of the film that you wrote. Yeah. Fortunately for me, lots of people have, have done that. I've gotten letters and run into a lot of people who tell me that, you know, they made critical life decisions based on, on that film. And many became teachers. Many were sort of on some sort of 
track to do something that they didn't really want to do in the movie, you know, sort of help them give themselves permission to to change life tracks and and do something else. A lot of people decided to become writers and so forth. And and um, you know, that's it's a it's there's some sense of responsibility there. I don't know what I can do about it. I just I hope they made the right decisions. But you know, I'm always grateful for people sharing that with me. And uh, um, so yeah, I've had uh, you know a number of people do that. It must have been strange to. Um to live through that summer of 89, which at the box office was the summer of Shulman, the summer of Shulman. Like you had not just this film in cinemas, but you also had a very different movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Now I'm, I'm guessing that, um, that wasn't also like an autobiographical film. There was no time in your life where you've accidentally invented a ray gun that shrinked your family. No, no. but you know, I, I, I did know that the, the, what what hooked me into to because it was a rewrite not a not a I, I rewrote the a, a, an existing script yeah and um what where I connected with it was when I understood because when I broke my leg and when I mentioned senior year of high school I broke my leg and I knew it was a very serious break they came to me right away and said you probably won't even be going they outlined all the surgery and everything I was going to have to have. you won't be going back to class and I said to them there's a hayride a week from next Saturday. I really want, do you think I'll be able to go? <laughs> and, you know, it's just ridiculous. I mean, you know, and, and I, with the kids, I knew that even though they had been, just been shrunk down to the, the things that mattered to them when they were big, like I think the girl, Amy was supposed to have a date with her, her boyfriend, you know, and so forth. Those were the things that, that motivated them to, to find themselves, to get back to normal size not the horror of being small, you know? So I related to the fact that they just really wanted to get back to, to all the things that meant something to them in their lives, you know? So that, that's, that's what guided me through that, yeah. that process. So it was personal in that way. Um, you know, and I, I sort of understood each of those characters from some, again, pick somebody in my life that would be, you know, that it would be, have those dilemmas and, you know, go use them. It's a story for another script apart, I suppose. But yeah, yeah, you that was a drama that you turned into a comedy, right? It was a very different first draft. Yeah, that's right. Um, it seemed to me, I, I you know, after, when when I was hired to do the rewrite, I think I only had seven days to do it, and they were, uh, I think Rick Moranis had told them he was not going to shoot the movie, was not happy with the screenplay, so um, they hired me. I think on a Thursday. And they said, you know, you can start working today, start writing today. And then a week from Sunday is the drop dead day for Rick Moranis. So we need to have you done a week from Saturday so we can pouch it to him in New York so he can give us an answer on Sunday. And then he's either going to show up on the set on Monday or not. So, oh my. so I said, you know, I got to think about this. I'll start writing on Monday. And they said, no, 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 you can't wait till Monday. No, under no circumstances. And I said, guys, I can write it in, in a few days. I just got to know what I'm writing. I got to think about this, you know, got to make notes. Blah, 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 blah. So they said, well, okay. They, they took me in a room where they had some of the um, action sequences outlined, you know, and, um, you know, I've never written porn, but apparently people who have tell me, you know, you write a scene and then they just stick a porn. And then you write a scene and they stick another type of scene. That's what the the action scenes were like, you know, B, B chase here, scorpion chase here, you know, those kinds. So you could you just had to write in, make those scenes work and kind of do what you wanted as long as the, they would somehow fit the way the characters were going. So um, <laughs> and then we watched The Incredible Shrinking Man, which had been the previous team's inspiration for the movie which is a drama you know a, 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 an existential drama really and um i just thought you know this honey i shrink the kid it's it, it wasn't the title at the time i think it was called grounded but uh and it was and but it seemed to me it had to be a comedy and they thought so too so uh so that was the job you know start to look at it from comedic perspective you know so so in in a strange way, it's like I remember there was a line in the movie where Wayne, the 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 man, the Rick Moranis character, had had taken all of his the, the neighbors up to the room where the machine had shrunk the kids, and and 
in the original script, he said, you know, they said, how do you, so the neighbor goes, how do you know it, it didn't blow him up? And he said in the other script, he would say something like, well, if it had blown them up, it, 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 and he would just kind of drift off. Well, to make that comedy, you just have him say, well, if it blown them up, there'd be pieces of them all over the wall, <laughs> you know, and say it like, like just, you know, <laughs> so it's that kind of thing that makes it, you know, you can transfer a drama to a comedy by just going further with things. So, um, so it had a good structure, you know, it was just about changing it. So, um, but it made it an interesting summer for me because suddenly, you know, you go from, <laughs> from non-entity to suddenly having two movies like that. And I, you know, didn't expect either one of them. I was really worried about them releasing Dead Poets Society in the summer. And I think Batman opened the week before. It just felt like we're going to just drown amidst all these blockbusters, you know. Um, and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids was not tracking. They do a thing called tracking where mm. they sort of figure out or try to figure out how how big an opening they're going to have and honey was not tracking well at all so it just looked like a disaster on the horizon you know for me. but uh it, it didn't turn out that way so so you had that crazy summer and then a few months later well i mean quite unfortunately for someone who like todd doesn't really like giving big speeches in front of large crowds you ended up picking up the oscar and having to go up on stage and uh yeah what are your memories of that moment and the kind of whirlwind of that night? You know, I, first of all, I didn't want to go. I said, why do I have to go to the ceremony? Because <laughs> if I win, I don't want to have to get up there and give this speech. I don't think I'm going to win, but I don't want to take the chance, you know. And then I was like, well, if I go and I just sit there, do you think they'll just accept it? My whole family was going, are you insane? This is the Oscars. You have to go. So uh, my parents came out for it, you know, and, and when, as I said, we're from Tennessee. So when my father arrived, I think studio had arranged for a limo to pick them up at their hotel and come and pick up my wife and I up for the ceremony. When my dad got out of the limo, he was wearing this bright white fringe kind of country music, the <laughs> cowboy hat and big flashy boots. I'm like, oh my God, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm from the South. It's country music. And I said, no. and he was joking, of course. He had his tux in there. So he <laughs> came inside and, and changed. And um, I can remember when the they were starting, you know, getting close to the my category. I was starting to get really scared. And you know, I thought, probably not going to win, but God, I, I'm not going to be able to handle this if this happens. And I can remember when they were reading the nominees and they were about to open the envelope saying to myself, please don't win. Please don't. Win. <laughs> please. I was mean, just like, like Todd would have been, you know? Um, and then going up on stage first, so there was somebody in the orchestra pit who I knew. And as I was walking up, she said, Tom, Tom. And I looked down at Donna. So we started having, and she goes, you, you better get up there. And so I, I went up there and, you know, babbled through because they on win, on the Wednesday before the Oscars, they have a luncheon. And they tell you in no uncertain terms, no matter how much you think you're not going to win, you better prepare a speech and it better not be over 30 seconds or we're going to play you off the stage. You must write a speech. And then somebody calls you on the Friday before the Oscars. Have you written your speech? OK, yeah, yeah, I know what I'm going to say. So you've got something in mind, you know, and they said, don't read it. Just so. OK, it's the worst of all worlds for me. So I got up and I forgot to thank people and. When I got off stage, I just felt terrible. And Jane Fonda had been my presenter. So as we as I walked off stage, we, she said, we need to go downstairs into the basement. There's, you know, the press is down there. And I said, okay. And we're standing by the elevator waiting to go down. And she goes, what's wrong? You just won an Oscar. You look like you're miserable. I said, well, I forgot to thank so-and-so and so-and-so. And she said, well, you know, thank them next time. Easy for you to say, you know, because she's in front of the public a lot. So we we get on the elevator, we go downstairs. The elevator opens into this room where you're on a little stage, and and there are these giant sort of plastic Oscars on either side, and the press is in a in a in a um, in all these seats in front of you. And Jane Fonda had just sort of returned to Hollywood after years of being away, and 
she was with Ted Turner and blah, blah, blah. So people, she introduced me and then she said, any questions? And people started going, Jane, Jane, what's it like with Ted Turner? Jane, do you have any roles? Jane, this, Jane, Jane, Jane goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not about me. This is about Tom. Please your, direct your questions to Tom. And someone said, Tom, ask Jane about Ted Turner. <laughs> and so she goes, that's enough. And she walked me off, you know. And I went snuck back into my seat. And so you immediately realize, you know, uh, that's this is <laughs> you're feeling like, you know, very proud of yourself and king of the world. And you're immediately sort of you're just a writer and <laughs> it's the actors that matter. And, you know, nothing has changed. So um, but it was it was a great experience, obviously. And, and uh, you know, sort of life changing thing. And, mm. uh, you know, when I got home, I think I had. 250 messages and from people I hadn't seen in decades, you know, yeah. calling on left messages on my answering machine and so forth. So it was great. It was, you know, I think I literally was on the phone for almost two weeks straight. After. <laughs> <laughs> now you've got a bit of distance from the writing of Dead Poet Society, the making of Dead Poet Society and the incredible reaction to it, including that Oscar win. What's your relationship like with the film today? Like, how often do you think about it? I don't think about it. I almost never think about it, you know. And um, when I was doing the play, I thought about it. I'm really proud of it. And, you know, lo the whole experience was amazing. Uh, but, you know, as a writer, it's, I think, important to move on, you know. I don't think anything about it makes you a better writer. I mean, I think just continuing to write and continue to sort of search for the things that that matter to you is 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 the part of the process that that I I really enjoy. So um, you know, it feels like I've for me kind of played out the themes that that I was working on exploring in that movie. So um, to the extent that they still inform my work, you know, they're in they're in the other things that I'm working on. So you know, it's it's um, you know, I don't think it pays to linger on these things. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned there the things you're working on. Can you can you tell me about uh, yeah your projects on the go at the moment and um, yeah what, what what people should be looking out for? Two indie films, one called Morgan Summit, and the other called Road Scholar. Road Scholar, I would say, is something akin to Dead Poet Society, or at least it's a it's a cousin to it, but it's it's a it's a college story, got a TV series that that I wrote with um, uh, Callie Curry and a guy named Trey Crowder. Uh, and uh, we have a producer, T-Bone Burnett, who's a great, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're we're working on that. In fact, we have a conference call about that a uh, couple hours. And, uh, uh, and then I've also written a, a sort of thriller that's I think is really exciting, very different. And, um, and that's something I'm going out with this week. So it would be a TV series. So, you know, it just uh, continue to plug away. Well, it all sounds really exciting, Tom. And um, yeah, I should let you go on and get ready for your conference call. I've taken up so much of your time. Tom, this has been an absolute blast. As I mentioned, I do have a really special place in my heart for this film. And it's been so much fun kind of digging into its creation with you. Oh, well, I appreciate that. I, I enjoyed it myself. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tom. We'll speak soon. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.